Good morning, everybody. Hi. Hi, Alex. <laughs> um, hi, my name's Nick. Uh, I'm one of the members here at the church, and I'll be leading our first part of the service this morning. Um, we'll be singing uh, and praying and hearing from the Bible later when Mitch comes to speak to us. But for now, we're going to start the service um, with these words from the first half of Psalm 30. The first half of Psalm 30. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands, stands firm forever, that you have established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crush Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You've created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Your arm is endowed with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand is exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in your light, in the light of your presence, Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They celebrate your righteousness. For you are their glory and strength. And by your favor, you exalt our horn. Indeed, our shield belongs to the Lord, our King, to the Holy One of Israel. Once you spoke in a vision to your faithful people, you said, I have bestowed strength on a warrior. I have raised up a young man from among the people. I have found David, my servant, with my sacred oil, I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him. Surely my arm will strengthen him. The enemy will not get the better of him. The wicked will not oppress him. I will crush, crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him. And through my name, his horn will be exalted. I will set his, sa his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call out to me, you are my father, my God, the rock, my savior. And I will appoint him to be my firstborn the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love for him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne, as long as the heavens endure. That was from Psalm 89. And that psalm that, that, that we've read, that we've listened to, it speaks and shows us everything that our God is. Our God is loving, he's eternal, he's faithful. He's most awesome. He's mighty. And this psalm also points us to Jesus and all that he has done for us. In particular, the enemy will not get the better of him. Sin, our sin, death. Jesus defeated that on the cross. He defeated that by being crucified and, and raised again three days later. And now it's Jesus that's exalted at the right hand. We can, we can meet together today in great hope and expectation that um, God is at work amongst us, is, is his church. So we're going to stand and sing and, and praise that now with our first song, What a Beautiful Name. As the band play, let's stand and sing. the words of 
As we stand, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning, Lord. We thank you that we can meet in expectation that, that you'll be at work amongst us, Lord, that you'll be at work in the, the words that we hear, in the songs that we sing, in the prayers that we pray, Lord, that you'll meet amongst your people this morning and you'll bless us with this time together. You'll bless us with the opportunity to encourage and to support one another. Lord, you'll bless us with the time to focus our hearts and our minds on you. Lord, we pray that you'll help us put the week behind us, uh, the week that's gone behind us. Lord, please help us to have hearts and minds that are really tuned into to what it is that you'll say to us this morning. Lord, please, please be at work. Lord, please, please give us the words that, and, and speak to us what it is we need to hear this week to take into the week ahead. Lord, to, to draw us more closely to you. Lord, we we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for this freedom that we've, we've got to meet. Lord, please help us to embrace it. And Lord, we pray that you'll, you'll make the most of this time amongst us. We ask in your almighty name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, there, are, there are many here today, which is, which is lovely. Um, Many familiar faces, some, some not so familiar faces, so I'll probably go through some housekeeping that maybe we don't normally do. Um, if you need the, the facilities at all during the service, the doors at the back, not the doors that go outside, that'll be weird, but the doors on the right-hand side um, take you through to some um, conveniences that you might need. There'll be tea and coffee at the end of the service, so please feel free to stick around um, and get to, know, get to know each other, get to know one another. Um, There'll be children's groups during the service, and they'll be noted through um, as we go. Um, 
As a church, we are in the, the thick of normal life and normal activities. We have our, our notices that are shared. These go out on a weekly basis via email. Um, if you don't receive the email, speak to myself, speak to Rich if he comes up, uh, speak to the, the person on the door, and we can make sure that um, you get the notices and you get the emails that come through. There is a particular notice on the notices this morning um, with the Friday WhatsApp group. Um, if that's you, if you attend the youth group on a Friday or you're a parent or someone who does attend it, please pay attention to the group this morning because there may not be a group this week, may not be a group. Alex is just shrugging his shoulders, he doesn't, he doesn't know. Um, but there, there might be, that's the important thing, there might be, so please pay attention um, and that will direct you to where you need to go. We have home groups that happen on a Tuesday and a Wednesday if you're not a member of a home group. Um, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, um, but speak to us, um, and we can make sure that happens. They, they are a good time of encouragement together. Um, evening service today, and prayer time and the coffee shop on Monday. They are all the notices um, that I am aware of. Um, others come out during the week. Um, this is the time together, and I've said we're going to read the Bible, we'll see which will come and preach to us later. Uh, we're going to stand and sing another song now, um, You Alone Can Rescue. Um, we, si we read in the psalm how amazing and mighty our God is. It points us to Jesus, it signposts us, signposts us to Jesus and everything that he has done for us. So as the band plays, let's stand and sing our next song, You Alone Can Rescue.
please do take your seats. <coughs> um, when it comes to a time of prayer now, um, we have a few things on our, our cycle that we, w- that we will pray for. Um, today we'll be praying for Robin Sylvia Anne Reeves, our, our missionaries that we support out in, in France. Um, we'll be praying for some elements of our church covenant uh, and for some church needs that we have. Let's bow our heads for this time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we've just sung these words. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. You alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us. You led us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. Lord, we... We highlight that word, you led us out of death. Lord, you, you came down to earth. It, Jesus came down to earth. He lived, he walked, he, he breathed. He died on the cross and he rose. Uh, th- these things actually happened, Lord. These things happened so that we might meet this morning and praise you and worship you for all that you've done. Lord, and, and that truth is a truth that can be known, is known across the world, Lord. And we pray particularly this morning for Rob and Sylvia and Reeves for the, the work they're doing in France to, to share that good news amongst the people there. Lord, we pray for them this morning that they'll have the energy needed to serve you in the, in the way that you've called them. Lord, we, we know when, when Rob and, and Sylvia and come to speak to us how busy that they are, how much energy that they need. And Lord, we pray that you'll sustain them and that you'll energize them in the work that you've called them to do. Lord, we think of the small groups that they have set up, they're looking to set up um, the challenge there to get people to, to spend time together and spend time looking and, and responding to Jesus. Lord, we pray for um, Rob's recent efforts in, in producing a book. Um, we pray that that book will be placed in the hands of those that need to hear about Jesus and those that need to be drawn close to him, those that need to turn to him. Lord, we pray for the churches that they've, they've supported, they've worked in, and that they've moved away from, that, that the leadership teams there will um, continue the work of, of Rob and continue to, to share the gospel of Jesus. And Lord, we pray also for the work they're doing to spread the gospel even further afield, through Africa, um, with the, the, the Korean teams they've put together and that they're supporting in, in North and West Africa. Lord, we, we thank you for Rob and Sylvia Ann. Lord, we pray that they're being encouraged where they are this morning and that they're in an encouragement to others. Lord, please help us as a church know how to, to continue to support them in, in the work that they're doing um, so far away. Lord, we pray for ourselves as a church. Lord, we pray... Um, for the element of the covenant uh, that that we're directed to this morning, that we'll meet together. And Lord, we thank you that there's so many here this morning. Lord, we pray that this time will be blessed by you. Lord, we're told in the covenant to submit to our leaders, Lord. And we pray this morning for Rich, for for Mark, for Andrew, um, for all those in the church, Lord, who have a a responsibility to, to make sure this church continues to run and continues to be gospel focused lord we pray that you'll help us as a a church body to to support them to encourage them to to make sure their eyes remain fixed on jesus and and the bible and that they're teaching us and leading us in a way that takes us to you and and shows us jesus and lord we pray that you'll help us to continue to to remember one another in prayer lord and we we pray in particular this morning for for pamela and carmini uh, with the the appointments and, and visits they've had this week to the hospital, Lord, we pray that your hand will be upon them, Lord, that you'll give them peace, that you'll give them wisdom as to how to interact with the, the, the doctors and, and all the appointments that they've had, Lord. Please, please help them this morning. Please encourage them this morning. And please may your hand be upon them this morning in particular. We ask in your almighty name. Amen. 
we're going to stand and sing again. We're going to stand and sing a song that um, reminds us that, like we read this morning, God is powerful and mighty, um, but that God is loving and kind and his, his arms are wrapped around us. So as the band play, we're going to stand and sing um, Everlasting Arms. After this song, we will be having our, our reading from the Bible. If you'd like a church Bible, there's Bibles at the back. Feel free to go and grab one now um, or during this song. Otherwise, as the band play, let's stand and sing Everlasting Arms. She's close. Please do take your seats. Uh, Damien, Damien didn't volunteer but agreed to come and do the reading for us today. Um, thank you, Damien. Um, it is from the series we're looking at in Isaiah, um, chapter 14, verses 28 to 32. Oh, wow. That wasn't supposed to happen. Close your eyes at Rich's notes, please. There we go. The words are on the screen, and the words are also in the church Bible on page 701. 
Good morning. This prophecy came in the year King Ahaz died. Do not rejoice, all you Philistines, that the rod that, that, the rod that struck you is broken. From the root of that snake will spring up a viper. Its fruit will be a darting, venomous serpent. The poorest of the poor will find pasture, and the needy will lie down in safety. But your root I will destroy by famine. It will slay your survivors. Wail, you gate. Howl, you city. Melt away, all you Philistines. A cloud of smoke comes from the north, and there is not a straggler in its ranks. What answer shall be given to the envoys of that nation? The Lord has established Zion, and in her his afflicted people will find refuge. Thank you, Damien. Um, Rich will come and uh, deliver the message on that after the next song. Um, we're going to stand and sing one more time. I will wait for you. Um, and the words of this song, I think, are appropriate to, to hopefully focus our minds on, on the sermon ahead. During this song, the, the children will be able to go to their groups. They will go out the back door. Um, there's no signal. The words will be on the screen, so you don't need to pay that much attention. You can just keep looking. There, Ella. Um, there's a band play. Let's stand and sing. I will wait for you. Oh, 
morning. There we go. Hi, uh, my name is Richard. I'm one of the leaders here, um, and we are going to be looking together at that passage read for us from Isaiah chapter 14, um, small and obscure, and we are in much need of our Lord's help, uh, so let me ask him for that uh, as we look at this together. Our God in heaven, as we have sung that we will wait for you, we will rely upon your word. Our Lord, this is your word. Uh, we ask that you'd give us help to rely on what you say to us here. Open our eyes that we might see. Uh, please move our hearts that we might respond to how you speak to us. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Uh, if you're happy and you know it, and some people are. There we go. That, that, I didn't, wasn't quite sure whether anyone would actually admit to being happy today. Um, uh, how can we be happy? Uh, the NHS on its website has some advice on how to be happier. Um, and I think that's an important question, isn't it? It's an unavoidable question, really. Uh, Blaise Pascal, the French mathematician and philosopher, um, he rightly observed that everybody seeks to be happy. In fact, he says that anybody, no, no, everybody does anything because it makes them happy. Anything we do, we do because we think it makes us happy. Or, or we don't do it because we think that not doing it will make us happy. Um, now, you can argue with him about that, but the NHS gives advice on how to be happier. In fact, it gives six things on its website that you can do to be happier. And one of those things, uh, it says you can boost your self-esteem. So if you want to be happier then you need to improve how you think about yourself. And there's a link that you can follow that up. So you can click on the link and take you to another NHS page about self-esteem. And on that page it says um, the, 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 the message that you are not good enough stays with you and you have to change the story, change that narrative that you are not good enough. Now, problems with self-esteem is a big deal. We're not really going to be touching that today, but it is interesting how that is tilted by the NHS. Uh, and I think there's something a little bit crushing about it. Because what it's saying is, if you want to be happier, the way to be happier is to find it in yourself to be good enough for life and all the challenges that you might face. And, and it, what it seems to be saying is that as long as you hold on to that idea, that belief that you are good enough, you can manage, you can do it, You've got the ability to hold it together. If, as long as you can do that, then you'll be happy. But what if you can't? What if you've let go? Uh, what if you find you have not got it in you? What happens then? I think Jesus tells a better story. Um, and our passage, I think, this morning will steer us towards it. Uh, we've been looking together at this prophecy of Isaiah um, written 700 years before the Lord Jesus was born. Um, and, and the message in Isaiah, throughout the whole book, it's a big book, is a call for the people to trust the Lord, to, to stop trying to replace the Lord with other solutions, with man-made solutions, but, but to find that the Lord and the Lord alone is the only safe place. Now, the section we're in, chapter 13 to 23, gives a series of messages addressed to other nations, various nations, and uh, our section today, chapter 14, verses 28 to 32, uh, just a, a short section. Uh, the message here is directed towards the Philistines. And it's um, packed with poetic imagery. Um, that means we need to read it with a bit of care. We need to work our way carefully into it to try and get a sense of what is being said. Um, but th these, these five verses it can be structured quite simply. Uh, verse 28 gives a setting. It tells us that this message came in the year that King Ahaz died. Uh, Ahaz had been king in Jerusalem for 16 years, and he was not a good king. Uh, the book of Kings describes Ahaz like this. It says, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He even sacrificed his son in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations. It's the year of his death, the end of his reign, and this message is delivered. Then, then in, in the message, verses 29 and 31, both of them give an instruction and then some reasons for it. Both of them say you should do this because of this. 
uh, and then kind of following on from that, the, the verses in between, verse 30 and 32, give a, a deeper basis for the instructions. Now, this message is about the Philistines. Um, uh, but, but it's a message that isn't delivered to the Philistines. It's important we remember that as we go through this section. Um, it's delivered to the people living in Jerusalem. Uh, they are to hear a message about these people over there, and as they hear it, they're to reflect on their own situation. Um, we'll, we'll try and do that as we look at it. Uh, the first instruction comes in verse 29, and it says, Do not rejoice. See, th there is something that has happened that is making the Philistines happy. A, a situation has occurred and they are rejoicing. And the message says, don't. Don't let this make you happy. You, you are wrong to be thinking that this thing is a cause to rejoice. Uh, in the book, The Revenant, which was turned into a film, it, it tells the tale of a man injured and lost in the American wilderness. Uh, and he comes across the carcass of an animal. Uh, and by this point, he is starving. He's absolutely famished, so he throws himself onto the meat and he gorges himself. Uh, and I guess there was some happiness in that moment, some relief. His cravings were satisfied and the, his stomach was filled, but the meat was bad. And soon after, he was spewing it all up. It should not have made him happy. Um, he shouldn't have rejoiced over that meal, however good it looked. However much it satisfied in that moment, it was superficial short-lived. He had not found what should make him really happy. Why would the Philistines be happy? Well, verse 29 says, do not rejoice that the rod that struck you is broken. Uh, the, the Philistines, by, by this point, were, were an ancient people. They had um, long, long before traveled across the sea from kind of the, the area of Greece. They'd moved into the the kind of the coastal land of, of Israel, modern-day Palestine, is named after the Philistines, although there's no link at all between modern Palestinians and ancient Philistines, but the name remains the same. Um, and these Philistines, when they came across, they were much more technologically advanced than the people around them. Um, and when the children of Israel moved into the land, these, these people were often in conflict. A Goliath is the famous Philistine we know, um, a champion chosen to represent the Philistine army and their gods and he laid down a challenge to the Israelites to choose someone to come and fight him, to see whose gods were greater. And young David, as we know, put himself forward. This giant Philistine looked at David and laughed at this unarmed child coming to, to fight him. Now, it's interesting as you read how Goliath is described. He was clad in the most up-to-date armor, the most advanced armor of the time. And the Israelite army didn't seem to have much armor at all. In fact, not long before it, the Philistines had prevented them from making any weapons. Uh, but David came out and said, the battle is not about who has the best weapons. It's not about who is biggest and strongest. It's not about who has it in themselves to win. The battle belongs to the Lord. And he slung the stone that killed the Philistine. Then David became king uh, and was often in battles with the Philistines. These, these battles went on. But under King David, the Philistines for a time were subdued. That didn't stop the fighting, though. It goes on and on in the generations that followed. And, and under King Ahaz, we're told in 2 Chronicles 28, under Ahaz, the Philistines had raided Judah and overtaken some of their cities. But our message comes in the year that King Ahaz died. Perhaps the Philistines think this is an opportunity. They sense that opportunity. And now this king who we've been fighting with, maybe now he's gone, now it's our chance to advance further. Now, back in Isaiah chapter 7, the prophet Isaiah goes to meet this King Ahaz, calls this King Ahaz to trust the Lord, but he refuses. He won't believe. He, he won't accept the word of the God, the word of God. And um, it becomes a very decisive moment in that line of kings that descended from David. Um, we're, we're told then that because of Ahaz's unbelief, it's almost the straw that breaks the camel's back. And at that point, the decline of the Davidic kings is, is irreversible. Uh, there will very soon come a point where there is no king on the throne in Jerusalem. Now, for the Philistines, that means that their historical enemy is fading away. That the enemy who they've fought against generation after generation after generation is going. Now, the Philistines are experiencing something that, ex that seemed good to them. And the message is, do not rejoice at this. 
Now, the people of Judah who hear this, they're, they're to hear this and see that all that glistens is not gold. Not everything that looks good is good. Not every meal will satisfy. There are some meals that will make us sick. Do not rejoice over this thing that seems good to you. I think that's a helpful caution, isn't it? Now, in our lives, there are things that happen, and on the surface, they seem like a good thing. And for the Philistines, the rod that struck them is broken. It sounds like a good thing. And for us, we may have those things that come into our lives. We experience a relief from some struggle. It, it may be that we receive good news from the doctor, or a, a difficult situation at work turns around, or maybe that relationship that seemed like it was just completely lost gets restored. Good things. But how do we know whether it's a good thing to rejoice in or to be wary of? Now, a friend of mine went through just a really difficult time in his life and a relationship with those closest to him, they broke down and he was just bowled over by this, and like very disorientated. He, was just, he seemed like he was lost for quite a long time. But then no, things began to turn around. He moved to a new area. He began a new relationship. He started a new job and his spirits lifted and he was happy. In a sense, you could say the rod that struck him was broken. The, he was relieved of these burdens. And yet in the process, he had walked away from Jesus. Uh, what kind of happiness was it that he experienced? Uh, you have to look at it. What, what, is it a superficial happiness or a substantial one? Now, is it that kind of candy floss happiness that tastes good and sweet, but it vanishes in your mouth and rots your teeth? Or was it a happiness that will go deep? down, something that will last, something worthy of deep joy. See, just because something makes us happy doesn't mean that it should. A rotting carcasses uh, can make the starving man happy for a moment. Uh, it's, it's important for us to deal with this, isn't it? Because we live in a world where, 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 where everything is asked, about everything is asked, does it make me happy? And we live in a world that says, if it makes you happy, that's the only criteria. If it makes you happy, go for it. I don't think it's wrong to ask that. I, I don't, in a sense, I don't think we can help but ask that question. But we don't want to ask it too easily, too lightly. As C.S. Lewis's words, I think, should ring loudly in our ears when he says, we are far too easily pleased. Now, this passage, I think, encourages us to delve deeper into the question of happiness. We wouldn't want to seize a momentary relief and miss a happiness that cannot be taken. Why should the Philistines not rejoice? Well, in verse 29, after that semicolon, it should say for. There's a reason. The reason that they should not rejoice is this. It says, for from the root of that snake will spring up a viper. Its fruit will be a darting, venomous serpent. It's vivid imagery. They're trying to convey that something worse is coming. There is a deeper threat you must consider. And what was the deeper threat coming to the Philistines? Well, Ahaz had a son called Hezekiah who became king after him. He was a king who did trust the Lord. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 18 tells us that Hezekiah defeated the Philistines. He pushed them back. The, the death of Ahaz was not a cause for the Philistines to advance. Actually, his son did a better job and pushed them back in the battle. But then no, Hezekiah wasn't the, the main threat to the Philistines at this time. And we've been looking in Isaiah how the, the, the mighty Assyrian empire was spreading across the world. Uh, it would expand into the land of the Philistines. Uh, John Newton was a pastor in the 18th century, and he, he wrote to a friend during a time of pandemic. Um, and, and during this pandemic, back in the 18th century, there was a great controversy about a new vaccine. Sound familiar? Um, lot, the people were tangled up in these arguments about whether or not it was a good thing. And, and Newton writes to his friend, and he gives some advice, and he says to his friend, I want you to imagine a city with 100 gates, besieged by an army all around. And in the city, they managed to block up one of the gates. And because they blocked up one gate, they, they sit back and they rejoice. But the other 99 gates have not been dealt with. 
See, that, that's the case for the Philistines. The rod that struck you was broken. But what about the plague of snakes pouring in through the other doors? The message to the Philistines is don't be blind to the threats that are coming. Yes, you have a momentary relief, but have a bigger sense of what's going on. And, and yet, I think this line about the snakes has other resonances. That's maybe how poetry works sometimes, and it is poetic imagery. The, the first resonance is the, the final snake, a darting venomous serpent. A literally, it is a flying seraph. That can designate a venomous snake. But the fact that Isaiah has already spoken in chapter 6 of flying seraphs as angelic warriors around the throne of God gives this implication here that what is coming to the Philistines will be a divinely sent punishment. See, the, the momentary happiness that they're experiencing must reckon with the ultimate reality of God and his purposes. The, the second resonance here is to ask, what is the root of that snake? That if the snake in question is Ahaz, well, his roots, the way he comes from, he comes from the line of David. Isaiah 11 spoke about the Davidic line like that. It told about the root of Jesse, David's father. Uh, Isaiah 11 told how that root would come and would be endowed with the spirit of the Lord. He would be the Messiah king. And this Messiah king would come and it says he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Now Isaiah has already been showing how all history is heading towards this day when there will be a total kingdom under a total king. A king is coming. That's Isaiah's message. He will come and be born in history and he will be the forever king. And he will reign over a kingdom that is perfectly just and fair at every level. He will bring in the age of eternal peace. And the Philistines are told that they must reckon with the one who comes from the root of David's line. And sooner or later, the Messiah would come. And when he came, the government would be on his shoulders. And happiness would be decided on how people respond to him. Don't rejoice that this rod has been broken because an unbreakable rod is coming and with him you will have to do. You see, if the Philistines rejoice in this moment because of the death of this king, the removal of this threat, they will have missed something vital. Rejoicing at one door blocked up, but 99 still open. And what does the reality of the living God and his Messiah mean for how they assess their happiness? That's the question for us probably, isn't it? No, so there's something that comes and it looks good. Looks like it could make us happy, but the question is, should it? Will it? Uh, I think then with that, the deeper, the deeper principle here is, is set out in verse 30. Two foundational things that need to be reckoned with in verse 30. Uh, look with me there. Two principles are put here. First one is expressed like this. The poorest of the poor will find pasture and the needy will lie down in safety. The poorest of the poor, my lexicon says that is the most miserable. You've got to imagine somebody who's got zero resources at their disposal. They're utterly destitute. Or somebody who just obviously cannot provide anything for themselves. That person is enjoying provision. That person is being pastured. They're being fed, provided for. And, and then we're told of the needy those who haven't got it in themselves to protect themselves from dangers, these needy are lying down in safety. Now this is upside down. It's saying those who have not, those who, who, who lack all resources and strength, those are the ones who are provided for and protected. It's what young David said to mighty Goliath. doesn't matter what weapons you have, Goliath. doesn't matter how strong you are. What matters, what will make the difference is not what you have, it's not what you have in you. The difference is what God has given. The battle always belongs to the Lord. Now the first principle is called grace. Grace, the gift that comes 
regardless of the ability or the deserving or the achievements of the recipients. Uh, Their happiness must reckon with this principle of grace. The, The second principle here in verse 30 is put like this. Your root I will destroy by famine. It will slay your survivors. So the judgment of God will come and the Philistines will be removed. That's what it's saying. And that is what happened in history. You know, be, beyond the end of the 7th century BC, the, the record of Philistines in history kind of basically disappears. So there isn't any mention of them again. But we have in verse 30 these two principles. There is grace and there is judgment. They're, they're put before the rejoicing Philistines. The message is, do not rejoice until you have reckoned with these things, with grace and with judgment. You are going to be held account to account for how you've lived. Uh, the message of Isaiah 13 is still ringing at this point in Isaiah. The, the message that the day of the Lord is coming, the message that sinners will be punished. But then there's grace held up. Grace for those who don't deserve it. Grace for those who cannot earn it. Grace put side by side with judgment. And the implication is that there might just be a way for those who deserve judgment to find relief. That there might just be a way for those whose sin makes them most miserable. For those whose deeds in life make them completely unworthy of any kindness from God. Those who have failed to provide a righteousness of their own that can stand before the judgment of God. And so they are needy unable to protect themselves. They haven't got what it takes. They're not good enough. There might just be a way for people like that to find safety. The first instruction in this short message to the Philistines, verse 29, do not rejoice. Don't be too quick. Don't be too easily pleased to find your happiness in a moment of relief. There is more going on. And the message was given to the Philistines, but it was for the people in Jerusalem. Given for these people in Jerusalem to consider how they will respond to moments of relief they face in their life. Will they be too easily pleased? Will they rejoice before they reckoned with grace and judgment? And the same message comes to us today. Now God has put so much good in our world. So much good for us to enjoy. And it is right that we enjoy the good in the world. It's right that it makes us happy. But as an old writer said, it would be an uncountable stupidity and blindness for us to stop there. An uncountable stupidity and blindness for us to enjoy a momentary good and stop and miss that there is more going on. That all of us are on a trajectory towards an unspeakable horror or an unending happiness. Imagine if we were a people so engrossed in momentary happiness that we missed grace and judgment in front of us. The first instruction is do not rejoice. Now the second one I think is much more hopeful. Verse 31 says wail. I think it is more hopeful but it takes a while to get there. Now this is the next instruction. In fact there's a series of them in verse 31. Wail, you gate, speaking to the gate of the city. Howl, you city. Melt away, all you Philistines. It's not necessarily a new message. It's just an intensification of the first. The first was don't rejoice because something worse is coming. Here it is now wail and howl. And then it says a cloud of smoke comes from the north and there is no straggler in its ranks. What's north? North of the Philistines were the Assyrians, and then were the Babylonians. They all came from the north, these armies, so much greater than anything Ahaz could do. And the cloud of smoke might indicate a kind of dust cloud as the army was advancing, or even that the army has begun to overtake cities and burn them, and the smoke is rising up. There's a great army coming. And in light of all this, it says, wail, lament. It is hopeless. Your hope has gone. Verse 32 asks, what answer shall be given to the envoys of that nation? I think this is probably one of the takeaways for the people in Jerusalem. 
See, that, that Assyrian threat growing and spreading was sending panic through the smaller nations. Uh, and all kinds of diplomacy was happening. In, in some ways, it's kind of similar to what's happening at the moment with uh, the kind of the, the nations around Russia are rushing to join NATO. That the threat of a big nation is forcing smaller ones to make alliances for protection. And that's what was happening in the ancient world. We've already seen in, in Isaiah that Aram and Israel were trying to join up with Judah in order to form a little alliance to resist the advance of Assyria. And so verse 32, I think, is asking, what if envoys from the Philistines come to Jerusalem and they want to make an alliance? What will you say to them? What answer should be given to this idea of finding your help in political protection? I think Isaiah wants the people of Jerusalem to think back to David and Goliath. The battle is not decided by who has the biggest and the best weapons. The battle belongs to the Lord. They must trust the Lord. But you know, again, I like that, that line about the snakes. Uh, I wonder if this line about smoke and ranks has other resonances. You see, just, just a few verses before this, in verse 13 of the chapter, it's describing king, the king of Babylon and how he wants to be like God. He wants to rise up into the place of God. He wants to go to God's house and he wants to rule in God's place. And, and it's described like this. It says, well, this is what he will say. He will say, I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. The, the pride of the king of Babylon, wanting to go to God's place and be like God. Well, verse 31 repeats those things. Literally, verse 31, although it's a bit clunky, says, From Zaphon smoke comes, and there is none alone in his assembly. And the, these words are repeated. The words Zaphon and assembly are repeated in these two verses. And, and even the word smoke designates the divine presence. In, in chapter 6, we're told the temple is filled with smoke because it's designating that God is there. See, on, on the surface, the, the threat for the Philistines comes from Assyria. But under that, that the deeper, immovable reality is God. That the reality is that God is in his place and that God will not be moved. It's not really Assyria they have to reckon with. It's the Lord God Almighty. And the message is not for the Philistines, it's for the people of Jerusalem. The people of Jerusalem are not to try and manage their problem with political alliances. They, because th what they must reckon with is not the political threats, but underneath it. It's not Assyria they, not, they must be fearful of. What they must be fearful of is the immovable reality of the Lord. They don't get tangled up trying to solve their own problems. They need to look and ask, what is God doing? What is God doing? Well, verse 32. Now, after the question mark, it should say four. Because this is what God is doing. This is what God is doing, it says. The Lord has established Zion. And in her, his afflicted people will find refuge. Isaiah, Isaiah has spoken of Zion before. Back in chapter 2, he has a vision of the last days. A vision of where history is heading towards. And he, he describes it like this. It says, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills and all nations will stream to it. This is Zion. This, this vision is, is where that original paradise of Eden will become full grown and the whole world will become the place of God's presence. Uh, Isaiah chapter 4 again returns to that day, that day where history is heading and it says, those who are left in Zion who remain in Jerusalem will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And it says that the Lord will wash away the muck. He will cleanse them from the filth of their sin. And it says, then the Lord will create over Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming light by night. Over everything, the glory will be a canopy it will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and hiding place from the storm and the rain. A Zion is the place of God's presence. A God is creating a place where he can be with his people and that place will be a place where they can be safe and happy. And this is God's purpose in history. 
to, to make this place where harms cannot reach. You know, the fears that corrode our confidence in this life, they won't be there. You know, the panics that cripple our ability to function, they can't reach that place. And the dangers that loom around us, maybe the dangers that have already met us, that we feel the hot breath on the back of our neck, we feel the claws scratching at our back, the harms we experience will not get to us in that place. And even the accuser's voice in our ear that wears us down, tells us about our faults and tells us that we are worthless, that voice will not be heard in that place. And even our disgrace and, and the shame that we carry like a heavy weight upon our shoulders, it will be left outside. It has no permission to cross the threshold. And our past hurts that still haunt us today, they won't be able to get to us at that place. And the threats, all the threats we can possibly imagine of, of, of war and of disease and of violence and of famine, or even the unseen threat of demonic powers that constantly plot our ruin, none will get to that place, to Zion. The life that God will create, a life that is endlessly happy and always safe. Now that's what his king, his son, is coming to do. That's what his son has now come to do. Dying and rising to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. So verse 32 says, the Lord has established Zion. This is what God is doing. And the implication is that in Zion, his afflicted people will find refuge. The afflicted, those who cannot fend for themselves, those who can't protect themselves or provide for themselves, those who aren't good enough, they will find refuge in Zion. Because the refuge of Zion is a refuge of grace. Grace, a gift that comes regardless of the ability or the deserving or the achievements of the recipient. That's where happiness comes. Now the Philistines are told not to rejoice because of a temporary respite. There's something more to reckon with. And then here God's people are told about Zion. You've got to reckon with Zion. What will Zion be like? Isaiah 12 has said it already. To shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Zion, that's the place for true happiness, lasting happiness, because it's the place where we can truly be with God. Later in Isaiah, in chapter 35, it will speak about the redeemed. It will speak about those rescued by the Lord, the afflicted of his people, those who cannot help themselves. And it says this. It says, they will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them. And sorrow and sighing will flee away. You know, this short message about the Philistines turns the, it turns the advice of the NHS on its head, inside out. And the advice of the NHS says, to be happier, you have to build your self-esteem. You have to find it in yourself to be good enough for life and all its challenges. But like the Philistines, the missing ingredient is grace. Grace because we haven't got it in ourselves to be good enough. Grace because what we rightly deserve from God is to be banished from all his goodness. But grace that says the poorest of the poor, the most needy can be safe and the afflicted can find refuge in the place of God's presence. And that place, that Zion, that's where everlasting joy is found. And grace says you don't have to be good enough. You don't have to hold on. You don't have to be able to manage with your own strength. Refuge in Zion is a gift. So the Philistines are told not to rejoice, but to wail. And I think that for them and for Judah and for us, that sets out a path toward hope, lasting refuge. Now, this is what they're told in verse 31. It says, wail, you gate, howl, or, or cry out, you city. Melt away, all you Philistines. That They're called to mourn, to, to cry out, but if they're to cry out, to whom do they cry? If they're called to melt away because all hope is gone, we might wonder hope in what? 
At the heart of the problem that Isaiah addresses is that people trust themselves rather than the Lord. The heart of the problem is pride. But, but if they do reckon with the immovable reality of God, and that they will give an account to him for their sin, then all that they can do is what verse 30 says, for 31. All they can do is wail, mourn because they've fallen so far. All they can do is howl, is cry out. Stop looking in themselves for a solution, but cry out to someone else and melt. Abandon all hope in themselves. Because people who do that are those who realize that life is more than they can bear. That they can't cope with what is coming. They haven't got what it takes. That realization is the hopeful path. Uh, Isaiah 30 shores it up as the hopeful path. And it says this, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. People of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. There is no safer place than to abandon hope in yourself and cry to God for help. There is no happier place and deep, enduring, lasting happiness than to give up on yourself and give all to the Lord. It's the better story that Jesus tells. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Do you see what Jesus is saying? He's saying that the blessedness, happiness, it's not for those who build their self-esteem by looking inside and finding they are good enough. Jesus says true happiness it's for those who realize that they lack. The poor in spirit haven't got what it takes. Are those who look at their performance in life and they realize they fall short of their own standards, let alone the Lord's. So they mourn, they wail, they're, they're grieved by what they lack, and they're meek. They don't pretend that they can dig deeper and hold on and find some inner strength. They abandon such hope in themselves. And Jesus says they will be satisfied. They will, will inherit the earth. They will inhabit the kingdom. They will imbibe heavenly comforts. They're blessed, says Jesus. They are the happy. Now, where does that land for us? What makes us happy? There is so much good that God has given into the world for us to enjoy. And we honor him by enjoying his goodness in the world. But there's a danger that we miss something much greater. And the message to the Philistines says, do not rejoice. And it comes to us. We must carefully consider where our joy comes from. You know, you know there was one occasion when Jesus told his disciples not to rejoice. And it's quite startling, really. It comes in Luke chapter 10. And uh, Jesus sends out 72 of his followers to take the message to their area around. And, and when they come back, but when they come back, it says the 72 returned with joy. And they said, Lord, even the demons submitted to us in your name. And they're rejoicing because there is this great good that they've seen. That they have been pushing back the forces of evil and darkness in the world. It is good. Jesus says, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Even when our joy is in something as good as that, there's a danger that we can be more happy in what God does through us than in what God has done for us. I've got to wonder, does it make us more happy to think about what we have done or than what God has done for us? Now, some of you know that I make bread, and this, this week was a bad bread week. I made two batches of bread at the end of the week that were very terrible. Um, I blame the yeast, of course. That's what a good workman does, always blames his tools. Um, and um, the first batch I just about rescued, but the second batch was terrible, like really, really bad. Like, and, and it crushed me. 
Because uh, you know, one of the reasons that I make bread is because it's, it's a tangible thing. I was talking to a friend about this last night. That it's, it's, a, it's a process where I, I kind of start with stuff and then I end with stuff and I can see what I've done. Uh, because most things in my life, I can't see any results from it. It's just throwing stuff out and nothing comes back. And, but bread, I, I throw stuff out and it comes back and I can see what I've done. But when I can see what I've done and it's rubbish, I feel terrible. Because what makes me happy is what I do. It's not good, is it? Does it make us more happy to think about what we have done, even in something as small as making bread or putting it to one side and thinking about what God has done for us? No, there is a kind of happiness that just circles back to me all the time, a kind of happiness that says I'm happy because I think I'm good enough. I'm happy because of what I have done, and if it just circles round and round and round, it will fizzle dry soon enough. But Jesus says there is a greater happiness. And rejoice, he says, that your names are written in heaven. That our deepest joy is written in eternal ink, inscribed in that book of life. The book of life that records not what we have done, but what he has done for us. So Isaiah 14, 28 to 32 shows that such joy is by grace. God's gift to the poorest of the poor. God's gift to the needy. God's gift to the afflicted of his people. I wonder, are are we in danger of of momentary joys in this life, swallowing our happiness in the eternal joy of belonging to Jesus. You know, it, it might be this morning that you're not sure you do belong to Jesus. That, that you haven't sought refuge in Zion. And I think the message of our passage today is, don't rejoice in stuff that will not last without coming to God for his gift of life that will never end. It's a gift. If if we come to him trying to earn it or pay for it or thinking we deserve it, we'll not receive it. It's only an empty hand that can reach out to take the gift. But if you cry to him for help, right now he is ready to be gracious. In fact, he is made ready by sending his son into the world to do what we cannot do. To live a life of perfection. And then take on himself the punishment we deserve and to do it for us. So that we can receive the gift. The gift of our sins forgiven. The gift of adoption into his family. The gift of his spirit living in us. The gift of our names written in heaven. The gift of our eternity secured and our future gloriously bright. An end date to every sorrow and the gift of home with him. If you cry to him for help, he is ready to be gracious right now. Perhaps, though, we do belong to Jesus. And even though we do belong to him, we find it so much easier to be happy in momentary joys. So much easier to rejoice in what we do than what God has done for us. Do not rejoice that the Spirit submits you. But rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And it is true that he still right now longs for you. Longs to be gracious to you. Right now in this moment, Longs to give you what you don't deserve. And you can cry to him. And as soon as he hears, he will answer. Let's take a moment. Speak to the Lord in the quiet of your heart about what he says to you today. Our Father in heaven, may we rely on your word. And your word says that you are ready to be gracious to us when we cry to you for help. So would you turn our hearts to you? May we cry to you, trusting that you will do all that you have said. Amen. Are we going to sing? Uh, This is a passage that speaks to us about grace, and we're going to sing about grace when the musicians are ready.
Please do stay around for refreshments um, afterwards. They serve at the back. And we're back here at 6 o'clock for our evening service. Um, all are welcome for that as we continue to look at Mark's gospel together. But now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. <laughs> 